Thanks, Sarah. Uh, I'd, uh, <laughs> it's always hard listening to a bio, but anyway, um, it has to be done. Um, look, welcome everyone. Thanks for, for joining us today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about investigation reports and hopefully um, you'll get a few takeaways out of it. We're trying to cram in an awful lot of information um, and just give you an overview of some things that we think that we could do better with our investigation reports to, 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 to try, create some change. So I'm sure, I'm sure there's some frustration out there and I, and I know it with, with the clients we see, the people we talk to, there's, there's absolute frustration about how their reports are, are being um, firstly bounced around between levels of management and the investigator and findings are being rejection, they're rejected and or, or amended. The reports are being amended. Um, you know, actions are being watered down. You know, timeframes because of this bouncing around and, and constant revision, uh, their, their timeframes are blowing out. And we just don't have the time for this. And, and ultimately we, we, we've got, you know, and even the actions themselves, as I said, watered down there. Yeah, administration actions are being favoured over engineering. And, you know, what we're not seeing being achieved from our, our investigations at all is, you know, we're not seeing a lot of reduction in risk. Um, we, do, we do maturity assessments with a number of organisations to, to measure um, how, how mature their investigation process is. And one of our key metrics, one of our, uh, is, is, is the reduction in risk as a result of the investigation, and we just don't see it. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to how we're presenting this information and the information we include to try and drive this change. Um, and that's what we want to talk about today. We need to sort of start changing why we do investigations or what our objective of an investigation actually is. You know, what we, we typically we're seeing, you know, restating or stating historical information regarding an incident. Um, you know, some linear thinking, um, some five whys and, and, and some actions created. And sometimes these actions are created in isolation. Uh, they're not created, they're, they're superficial or, and we see a reluctance to drive greater change in the organisations. Um, what we want to start seeing is a business case approach to our investigation reports. Because if we want to initiate change and enable learning and improvement within an organisation, we have to change our approach of how we do our investigation reports. They can't just be restating historical information. And business cases are a critical piece of documentation that, that outlines business problems and provides options to solve it. We need to start putting ourselves in the position of the reader. What are we trying, what are we getting, what, what do we want the reader to take out of it? What, what do we want, what action do we want the reader to take? And utilizing this business case approach is the best way to do it. But firstly, we need to know what change we want, what change we want. And one of the big issues we see is a lack of, for some reason, yep, sorry, I just had a problem with my mouse. What we'll see, what we're seeing is this is, is a lack of decent controls, a lack of higher order controls. What I'd ask everyone today on the call today is if you were to go through your last say 18 months, two years of investigations, remove all the admin actions and ask yourself, what's left? What's left? And typically, we're seeing not much. I mean, this is straight out of the code of practice, the model code of practice for managing risks in the workplace. We're not seeing the higher order controls. We're not seeing engineering controls. We're not seeing substitution. We're not seeing isolation controls. We certainly don't see too many elimination controls. Right? What we are seeing is controls like discipline. Although that's, to be fair, that is just declining quite remarkably. But we are seeing lots of training lots of toolboxes, lots of rewriting of procedures. And I think, and we think this comes from a lack of being able to clearly demonstrate with our controls of what is reasonably practical. 
And I think that comes from a, a place, you know, because every, every organisation is bound by budget, right? Every organisation is bound by budget. So we sometimes constrain our investigations, including what we look for, in terms of what the business can afford. And that's fraught with danger. That's fraught with risk. What we need to be doing is looking for what's reasonably practical. Now, there's definitions out there for reasonably practical, but what we're talking about is weighing up things like the likelihood of the hazard risk um, occurring, the degree of harm that might occur. We're looking for those things. What the person, what what the what what the organisation knows or ought to not reasonably know about that. The availability in suitable ways to eliminate or minimise risk, and looking at how those costs are associated with the available ways. Um, in Australia, what we've seen is this: we we, we used to talk about ALAP, um, and now we talk about so far, or so far as reasonably practical. Now, the issue here is there's not a lot of real definition. There's not a lot of work around. Um, so far as reasonably practical. They are actually different concepts, but in health and safety, we do tend to treat them very similarly. Um, ALAP for engineers will mean a much different thing um, for health and, to health and safety people. So we, we, will, we will stick with the health and safety version. And, and so there's some similarities between ALAP and so far, but they are different. Uh, I encourage people to go out there and have a bit of a look at it. But we're talking about this concept of reasonably practical and involves weighing those um, risks up against the trouble, time, energy, money, money needed to put it in, needed to control it. And that's what we're looking for, you know. And, and ALAR is about making sure that the benefits of risk reduction measures are weighed against the sacrifice, the cost necessary to achieve this. How do we make this decision? And one of those key concepts that we'll talk about is grossly disproportionate because that's clearly a measure we need to know because we need to know when is enough is enough because anything that's not grossly disproportionate, we really need to consider seriously. So this is a little model of, of, of so far. Look, again, there's different models out there. Uh, Google them, you'll find them out there. But this is the one that sort of sits, resonates with us. And basically, intolerable, the risk reduction, you know, that we can't take this that risk regardless of cost. So either we don't take the risk or it doesn't matter what the cost is, we don't take the risk. So I guess it does, don't take the risk. Broadly acceptable, that says that relevant good practice, you know, we've got it fairly well under control, um, those low level, those low level risks. In the middle band is where this tolerable if so far typically sits. And it, and it, combines these really these three things what we're talking about here is that it's by relevant good practice it means these are the, the, these controls are out there they're known they can be implemented they are there we know about them um, we can implement the control measures there are risk reduction methods we can put in plus they're not grossly disproportionate and and we'll talk a little bit about that we won't go deeply into grossly disproportionate because I could spend an hour and a half talking about grossly disproportionate easily, easily, uh, or actually probably longer. Where we need to start, and this is going to, and this is controversial. Um, this is a real step change for people in safety. We're used to having a finding and then basically our actions reverse the finding, right? What we need to do is start putting more information in our investigation records to prove to the decision makers, and let's face it, right? Decision makers are the ones that control the resources. Decision makers are the ones that control the budget because at the end of the day, every control we put in a business has some monetary value, whether it be it personnel, be it engineering, be it eliminating a task or a risk, they all cost money. And that's how managers think. And they have to think in these terms. They think in terms of spreadsheets. We have to start communicating in a language that they understand and they can grab hold of and make sense to them. So when we talk about value of preventing an injury or of a fatality, we've got all these different ways of, of, of valuing a fatality. But 
the, the most common way we talk about it, the most commonly used term, and some of you might not know it, some of you might know it, is the value of a statistical life. Now, basically what that is, is a determination made by the business of what a statistical life is valued at. It gives a numerical value, a currency, if you like, to the value of a life. Now, there's a number of ways of doing it. Again, we don't have time to go into that today. Um, in the larger organisations, your risk governance people in charge of risk, if they're a separate to health and safety, they should have this. Uh, it should be part of their bread and butter to know these figures. Um, smaller organisations might not, and they might have to go work that out. There's a number of papers written. Um, Safe Work Australia has quite a lengthy paper um, in there, but it's, it's dated 2008, but there is some more uh, updated stuff around if you look. Um, now, basically what it is, is we measure what the life's worth. And it's and, and typically, and there's a number of different ways of doing it. Um, typically it's about 40 years of life they're valuing. Um, and it includes, you know, there's, there's the cost of the business in, you know, training, replacement, recruitment, lost wages. Um, there's the, and then combined with the, 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 the value of a person's life to society. Um, yeah, their partners, their, their, what that would contribute to society overall. The last uh, thing I read put on average, most organisations were around the five million mark for the statistical value of life. But once we do that, it gives us the ability to do things like cost benefit analysis. It gives us the ability to weigh the cost of implementing something as opposed to not implementing something. And we'll talk about that a bit later. The thing with so far, that doesn't matter. Reasonably practical does not, and this is the big kicker, is not influenced by the ability of the PCBU to pay. Just because you don't have the money doesn't make it grossly disproportionate. Just because you don't have the money doesn't make it not reasonably practical. Doesn't come into it. If you can't, if, it, if, it, if it's not grossly disproportionate and it's in a control that can be implemented, therefore you should implement it. If you don't, then you shouldn't. If you can't, because you can't afford it, then you can't take the risk. You have to stop whatever that task is, whatever that work is that involves that risk, that has to stop. And the courts will start to look for this more and more and more in terms of what was reasonably practical to do. Grossly disproportionate is part of that, all part of that. Again, it's it's quite a it's quite it's quite a different concept, but basically, it's it's a factor that it's a disproportionate factor that that organisations put in, right? That they they determine it's typically between one and ten, and they base it on um, on different factors like the likelihood of the risk, the amount of people exposed to the risk, um, the, the, the consequence of the risk, um, the, and that's how they do it. And, and, and basically they combine it with gross, with the, with the fact, with, with the statistical value of life, and then we start to get a grossly disproportionate factor. It's really important that we understand the concepts of what, are the, what we're trying to basically say here is these are the benefits of implementing the control. And this is the cost, the potential cost if we don't implement the control. We're basically leaving a cost benefit analysis, which we'll talk about a little bit later and putting in our report. So I know that is probably a, a fair bit to get people's heads around today, but please look up. We, we'll, we'll be putting out some more information in the coming months about, uh, about this, um, but the first step is in understanding your controls and what controls you want to put in is, if we're especially we're looking at engineering controls, because quite often we hear the argument based on cost, we can't do that, we can't afford it. Well, that's got affordability has got nothing to do with reasonably practical. And to determine reasonably practical, we need to know what the benefit of that control will be. And to work that out, we have to, we have to work out what the cost of not implementing the control will be. And this is how we do it. Statistical value of life combined with grossly disproportionate. So have a look at a couple of those, uh, those, those concepts um, in your own time. And if you've got any questions later, come back to us and uh, hopefully we can try and answer them. 
Um, uh, probably won't be able to answer all today, but um, we, as I said, we are putting out some more information about this uh, in the coming months. One of the, we'll move on from that. So basically what we've done is we've determined our controls might be elimination, be it engineering, because we're trying to we're trying to hit that higher order, uh, higher order of the hierarchy of controls. The next issue we see, and the reason reports get bounced between levels um, from the risk owner back down to the investigator is because we haven't socialized it. And that, this is a key part to our investigations is socializing. Because if there's one thing that managers hate more than anything else, it is surprises. It is surprises. So when we're doing an investigation, it's really important that we socialize the entire investigation. So when we do an investigation, we, we find out who obviously the risk owner is, who the investigation owner is. And as we learn about key findings during the investigation, those key issues, those key risks, we let them know. So right from the very start of the investigation, as soon as we find something out, we, we either organise a meeting or we orchestrate a meeting. Um, and they're two different things, right? Um, and, and it could be 30 seconds. It could be a minute. It could be five minutes. It depends on that. But we want to make sure by the time they actually get a hard copy report in their hands, that basically they're just flicking through stuff they already know. I see too many investigations where the first time the risk owner sees the investigation report is when it ends up on their desk. And then they go, well, I don't agree with any of this. And that's what we wanted to talk about. So we, we, we socialize our findings and then we start to socialize the recommendations we're going to put in. And by socialize those recommendations, it's not just with the risk owner, it's with the, also with the person who's responsible for implementing those recommendations. So it might be, a, you know, it might be a maintenance manager. It might be a, a training manager. Um, it might be, um, you know, procurement. Uh, those people responsible for it, we need to start socialising with them as well because they're the best ones out anyway to help us develop those actions because it's their work, right? But if we get them on board, they become a stakeholder, they become an engaged stakeholder, they, be they become, have ownership. So we start to build a team. So when we go forward with these recommendations, they're not, they're not surprised, they're not blindsided, and the risk owner isn't either. And they've got, and you've got the support of those stakeholders when delivering that message to the to the to the to the, to the, to the risk owner. So that's what we do. We, we get the stakeholders to help deliver that message. Now, one of the things that I use a lot when I'm doing this is what we call the elevator pitch. I'm sure lots of you have heard of the elevator pitch. Um, it's just basically four steps, right? And you imagine yourself, you're in an elevator with a risk, with, with a decision maker. Um, you've got the time it takes for the elevator, uh, for you to get on the elevator, for you or them to get off the elevator to deliver what you need to do. You've got to be clear. It's got to be simple. You've got to develop that concept so they can, concept so they can understand it in that short period of time. And you present the problem, the solution, and you say, this is, and you add that call to action. This is what we'd like you to start considering. You can either organize a meeting with them and just say, look, I need five minutes of your time. You should be able to do this in less than five minutes. A couple of minutes is all we're talking about here, right? And you can even orchestrate it. You know, if you know they have a meeting at nine o'clock in the morning, there's, you know, ambush them. Ambush them on the way out, by the way, not on the way in. Hang on, you know, sometimes it pays to lurk around. <laughs> it's as dodgy as it sounds. But, yeah, orchestrate the meeting. And, it, and, it's, and it's quick and it's often and you repeat it. So by the time they get that, it's not there. So first step, make sure you can demonstrate the cost of your controls are valuable and are grossly disproportionate and are reasonably practical. Second step, start socialising during the investigation. 
don't wait till the end of it during the investigation right through from findings right through to actions and recommendations we start doing that what we really want to do is achieve change so we talked about that business case creating a business case to show key stakeholders how you plan to solve a problem weighing up time scales and costs too often all i see is a table and it's it's great because we see this little table down the bottom or maybe at the top depending where it's shoved in sometimes it's put in twice and it, it's basically you know what the recommendation is maybe even hierarchy controls date and who's responsible and that's it and we just assume that from our investigation report, the rest of our engagement report, there's a clear argument for this action or recommendation when actually there's not. We have to make that. This is where it's going to cost us some time. This is where it's going to cost us a bit of, a bit of effort because we, we need to give the information to the decision maker and decision in, in the format that they, they need, right? And if we want to be effective, we, we can break a business cases have these answer these four key questions. What is it? What's the reasoning behind it? Who are we trying to convince? And what is the action we need? We've got to propose it and we've got to be specific with what we're, we're proposing. Nothing annoys me more. And sometimes we see this with, with, with you know, large scale recommendations um, or Consider a plan to do this. Uh, review this. No, be specific. We want to implement this control. We want to put in proximity sensors on our people and on our equipment so the equipment stops automatically. It doesn't hit them. Not consider a proximity alert system. That's just way too open. You know, that doesn't drive change at all. That's not sexy, right? We want to give a, an irresistible argument. So be specific with what you're proposing. Then the business case presents this absolute reasoning and rationale for implementing it. Why does it make sense? What are the benefits? What are the outcomes that will be achieved if we do this? We can't just say, oh, it'll fix the finding. That's not good enough. We have to put more in. We have to put more in. Make sure we target it to who we're trying to convince. We're already convinced. We're already convinced. There's, chances are our stakeholders, in terms of our, the people who, might, you know, our, our colleagues, they're convinced. You know, everyone knows the right thing to do, but we've got to make it. A, we've got to drive this irresistible case change to the person who actually makes the ultimate decision, and if that is, let's face it, whoever holds the money, whoever holds the money, right? And then we need a commitment for action. We need to get them to support it. We need to get them to fund it and resource it. And that's what we need to do. So that's our framing for how we're going to write our investigation reports. That's our framing. The written investigation report. Geez, I've seen some long ones. Um, way too long. Way too long. I, I don't know. Oh, oh, okay, let's be honest. I don't know of anyone in the business that's not time poor to start with. Um, and when we, the further, the further we go up the tree to the decision makers with the most amount of money, the biggest the budget, the, the more control over the budget, the less time they have. Start stripping them back. Only put in the things you need. Be brief, right? Make it interesting, right? Um, strategic alignment is so important. We'll talk about that as we as we finish off today. No conjecture, no jargon. Remember, right, and this I see this often in organisations. Whoever writes a report, report, lots of acronyms, lots of jargon. Um, but the person reading the report may have some peripheral understanding, but they don't have deep understanding, right? Make sure we keep the language easy to understand so that a layman, because you never read it. So it might even require going to members of the board who actually great business acumen, but actually the, the, the nitty gritty of, of the details, they, they don't understand that, right? We talked about demonstrating value. We'll talk about that a bit more and just be consistent in style and make sure it's readable. 
make sure it's readable. Um, look, this is this is sort of where we look at. We try and keep it brief, right? We have an executive summary, which includes our overview, some options appraisal, some costs and benefits right up front. Bang, first page, hit them with that. We talk about the scope of the investigation very briefly. We provide some background context, but only is it, 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 it returns to our findings. We do our sequence of events, our findings and conclusions, and then our recommendations. And probably the biggest change here, that middle bit that's in black, that's pretty standard. Um, there are some recommendations we'll make in there, but it's this, the, 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 the top and the tail where we're really proposing we do some different things. Writing a report. A lot of people get stuck writing a report. They don't know where to start. Um, we end up with a lot of unnecessary information in a report um, that doesn't really um, provide much context, make, context that makes it hard to read. Uh, and if it's hard to read, we lose our audience, right? We lo lose our audience. What we want to do, what we, do, we, what I personally do, and what I recommend our people do, start at the back. By the time you've gone through investigations, you already know what your recommendations will be. You already have them. Start with them, and then your findings. Findings are pretty easy, right? Start with your recommendations. Write those first. Then we write our sequence of events or that the, the, the summary of the event or whatever, your event summary, whatever you want to call it. And then we write the executive summary last. That's the last thing we write as the executive summary. Right. When we start with recommendations, there's a number of ways of doing our recommendations. You can, you can use a cost-benefit analysis. We'll talk about that. A comparative an assessment of risks, costs, and benefits. We'll talk about that. Comparisons between codes and standards, you know, codes of practice and standards, and how we compare with that, and whether we're, you know, and that we're not aligning or we are aligning, and and that's becoming more relevant as we go, with um with with um, the legislation and the updates to legislation WHS framework. Um, we can look at a hazard, Chris. We can use audit against good practices. An improvement approach, judging an approach. I'm not going to talk about them all. We're just going to talk about the top three there as the ones we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> the first one we'll talk about is this recommendations or the options analysis. <clears throat> what we rather than just give typically what we do is we go, here's your only option. This is the only action we came up with that could do that. Rather than do it that way. What we're suggesting, one of your alternatives is to give people, give the decision makers several options, right? Give them at least three. The first one has to be doing not much, either not doing anything, right? Or doing not much. Now, every organization will have sort of like a business case um, pro forma. You might use it for CapEx, you might use it for different things. Um, but what we're after for is, you know, Option one, two, and three, we're looking at benefits, disadvantages, time scales, costs, risks. However, that suits your organization. This is just an example of one that we can use, um, <clears throat> that we've used in the past. And um, it seems to work at driving some thought process because we want our decision makers to have a risk management approach when they're evaluating the potential options we're putting in front of them. Now, hopefully that's readable with the font size. Um, here we've got we've we've got one that, and basically it's involved. This was involving a um, um, a forklift set in in pedestrians. Um, so the first one was option is review the procedure. <laughs> How often we hear that? We're going to review the procedure. Thou shalt not work with walk, walk in front of forklifts, and forklift drivers will look out for pedestrians. Right. We know it's low benefit. We know there's the disadvantages are at the high end to extreme. There's no organisational change. There's no risk reduction. But we can put it in a day. It costs us a day. Um, but again, it's admin control and there's no risk reduction. Option two, we can, we can install some bollards, you know, to, to, to stop either people or, or, or the equipment breaching pedestrian areas. 
the problem with you know it's 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 highly easy to to do it's adaptable we can move the bollards if we need to we can put them where we need to um but they do provide limited protection all right the time scale we could probably get in one to three months because let's face it we can buy them off the shelf pretty much we can go to to anywhere you can buy them online or whatever um estimated cost look we've made that cost up might be 20 grand to put them in the risk moderate it's a soft engineering control. It requires pedestrians not to walk past the bollards, and it requires. Um, and by the way, I was I was, I was at a, an organisation the other day where I saw a machine hit a bollard, and it did nothing to protect. Uh, it was actually a piece of equipment it was protecting, and still smashed the equipment anyway. So there is some risk reduction. Option three: a proximity system, and obviously this is just like a table. We could put this in a lot more detail uh, in in the investigation report. Um, you know, the benefits uh, are high. Um, for some reason, I've only got workers trained there, but we actually have a, uh, I've missed, I haven't put in a little bit there. You know, it will automatically stop and, and, and prevent uh, the equipment hitting the workers. Um, no real disadvantages. Um, six to eight months to put in, because, you know, there will be a time frame to put it in. Uh, got to, it's got to go on equipment in on people. There's installation and training. We've got the costs in here. So the costs are higher. Now, those costs might be high for some organisation. It still might be low for others, depending on the size of your organisation. Um, and it's and we end up with low risk. Worker safety is prioritised. There's a high level of risk reduction. Presenting different options. Give them a choice. Give them a choice. And that way, hopefully, we're less likely to end up just doing a procedure and we're more likely to end up at some engineering isolation controls, which would be good. An alternative is a cost benefit analysis. And again, utilize your company's own CapEx type um, procedures that you already might have. Um, there's typically business case and, and they do typically have cost benefit ways of demonstrating that. There's no reason we can't leverage that, right? What we're looking for is to be able to show that the benefits of the, uh, the, 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 the control, the initiative, the intervention outweigh the negatives, right? And again, we go back to what we talked about. We make sure that it's not grossly disproportionate, right? It's reasonably practicable. Um, and I, as I said, the cost to the, the, the organisation doesn't, doesn't matter. It's got to be detailed. And this is where it takes time. And, and I hear people saying, but I don't, know how to, I don't know who that is. I don't know what to do there. Um, you know, I'm not an expert in the cost of engineering something out. Most organisations have project people. They have someone that looks after projects. You have engineers Typically, all most engineers uh, in those head office roles, their job is project work and estimating and getting costs. They'll be of great value. And you don't have to nail them down fully. We're after ballpark here. You know, we're not after, if you can get an exact quote, great, get an exact quote. If you can't, ballpark it. But make sure we notice that. Make sure we put approximate in our, um, in our report, right? Leaders can't make decisions based on lack of information. They need as much information they possibly can, right? Much information as they possibly can. Right? We're looking at capital costs, through life costs, right? Costs of the asset repair. So we're talking about, so if we're looking at an engineering solution or, or you know, some sort of equipment solution, it's cost of life. What's it going to cost us to bring it on, maintain it, service it, run it? dispose of it, train people in it, all those costs we need to include. We need to be fair. We can't hide anything. We need to give decision makers all the information they possibly need to make these decisions, look, make these decisions. Some of the terms we use, value of risk reduction. So if we put in the risk, Basically, we look at the change of likelihood. So grab your risk matrix out. If we're going from possible, unlikely, rare, what the change is, times the life of the control, 
times of statistical value of life, times of how many fatalities we could we could possibly have. Because sometimes we're looking at two fatalities, three fatalities, depending upon the, the risk, right? That's the value of risk reduction, the cost of the control. As I said, the annual cost of maintaining it, the life of the control, that implementation cost, and that change of likelihood. Current mitigated likelihood to the mitigated likelihood. All those equal that value of risk reduction. That's probably my favourite way of demonstrating to an organisation that this control is worth putting in. I can demonstrate clearly there'll be a re reduction in risk. I can demonstrate clearly what that reduction in risk will cost to, 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 to intervene and I can and to implement, and I can demonstrate clearly what the cost, the potential cost is if we don't implement the, the control and the, and, and, and the worst case scenario occurs, the credible worst case scenario occurs. So we need to make sure we put those things in. We need to make sure we put them in. The last one, I'll, uh, the next one I'll talk about is this comparative risk. And basically, you know, using qualitative risk assessments. So not semi-qualitative risk assessments, a more qualitative style risk assessment, right? We're identifying risks. Again, it's that measurement of likelihood um, and impact of the risk event. It's that determining that risk severity, what the, the risk reduction will be, um, we can we can use it in a graphic or report as a risk matrix or whatever we need to do as you know as limited as they can be, um, but we can actually put it in some sort of terms. Um, so this is the risk we've got now. This is the risk we will have if we don't put it in. Oh, uh, we sorry. This is the risk we have without the control. This is the risk we'll have if we put the control in. Right? Which problem is better? Which way do we want to go? And you can do that for you can do that under options as well. You can do that with a number of things, but that comparative risk uh, analysis is a really good way of, of demonstrating the benefits of putting in an intervention. Um, as I said, there's a, there's, there's a few more, but the last one I'll talk about, this is the comparison with codes and standards. Um, what we're seeing now more and more and more um, is the, the regulators in, in, in conjunction with Safe Work Australia bringing out more and more codes of practice. Um, now, and we're seeing with the framework, there's direct links in the framework, the WHS legislation, to these codes of practice. And we're not still, we're not, we're not, this is a tool we can utilize when we're writing our reports to go, well, hang on, we're not even meeting the code of practice, right? Um, you know, they've just recently, SafeWorks released their, their, their psychological um, code, for, dealing with psychological, psychological, oh my God psychological risk in the workplace. Wow, can't say that very well. Um, and there's control measures in that. We can compare that. Are they in our business? If we've, if we've just determined a psychological risk in our business. But there's others as well. And there's the standard ones, confined spaces, work at heart, whatever it might be. But look for those codes of practice, legislation, standard practice, national industry standards, because there's industry standards being published. You know, transport has industry standards. They have their various industry bodies. Grab those, <clears throat> compare those and say, well, hang on. You know, we're not going to meet our obligations with WHS. We're not going to meet our obligations with this. Provide that justification for that intervention because draw a direct link. Again, it's that argument for change. One of the things that we really do and recommend is starting to actually look at strategic alignment between what you're recommending the organisation implement and the strategic vision, plan, objectives, values of the business. So make it key by implementing this intervention ABC or you know, intervention one, this clearly aligns with our strategic plan to achieve this. Make that obvious, give again, it's giving that decision make, oh, okay, so this aligns to our strategic plan. This aligns to our, aligns to our strategic, uh, to our values, our vision, whatever it may be. Make the link, spell it out. Uh, it's a and this is probably the easiest thing you'll do. 
this is a this is a this is a quick opportunity. It's an easy opportunity, uh, and it's a sentence you can throw in. I put it in my executive summaries um, to make sure people understand. Oh, okay, bam. Um, this aligns to our strategic uh, strategic alignment. There's a strategic alignment within us, what we're trying to achieve. Um, and uh, yeah, again, it's creating that irresistible case for change, right? Um, so we talked about recommendations in our report. Next one's we write up, we've written our recommendations. We've got our findings, roughly you do those at the same time. We look at our sequence of events. Now, too often, I see way too much rubbish in sequence of events, right? Um, firstly, focus on what, not who, right? When we're talking high potential near misses or we've seriously hurt someone or there's been a fatality, they're an organisational failure, right? That's an organisational failure. So focus on the what, not the who. I see, you know, quite often in investigation reports where the investigation uh, has all this great stuff around um, in, the, in the findings, in the executive summary, it's all about organisation, it's in the action, it's all about organisation. You read the sequence of events or the, or the summary, the event summary, and it's all about people. So firstly, focus on the what. Only put in things that either directly relate to your findings or provide context to your findings. Anything that doesn't, don't put it in. Include photos and images within it. Don't put them as an appendix. When you read them, I know we don't read magazines anymore, but when we used to read magazines, we don't, we didn't read a column and then go to the appendix at the back to find the photo. They put them where it makes, make, makes sense, right? Only facts, no analysis. Now, by the way, I attach nothing to my investigation reports. I don't attach a timeline. I don't attach, attach some sort of Excel chart. I don't attach any, any statements. I don't attach any of that. This is not an investigation I'm giving them. This is an investigation report. That we give them the investigation stored in another system. Um, make yourself make it life easy. The executive summary, a brief overview. This should be no longer than half a page. A quick options appraisal, a quick cost and benefit cost and benefits appraisal. Summary the main points. Right. We want this so that the the reader can read this and pretty much know everything else that's going on behind that first first page will be covered maybe in more depth, but really they could just rely on that first page. Short, sweet, half a page, maybe three quarters at the most, but certainly not more. Pitch your case, right? Gather as much information as you can from stakeholders, right? Make sure we write it out of order, as we said. Check with stakeholders as you go, as we've said. Do a final read through. There's nothing worse than reading a report and there's poor grammar, spelling mistakes, stuff missing, inconsistent fonts. I know it sounds lame, but geez, let's let's get better at that. If we want to come across as professional, be considered seriously, we've got to do that. And then if you, when you're presenting it, don't just email it. Plan a meeting, deliver it in a meeting, right? Deliver in a meeting, right? When we present our case, think about how you're going to do it, right? Don't just send in the written report first, then present. My, my preference is present it first in the presentation, then back it up with the report. Maybe you're not even the best person to present it. Maybe the best person to present it is the person, people involved. Get them involved. Maybe it's the stakeholders who are going to fix the issues you've recommended, maybe they are better, maybe it's a joint, right? Maybe you can use PowerPoint, videos, whatever works, don't get trapped in this. We just don't get trapped with the email ping pong and yo-yo bounce back. It just, it's so frustrating, right? It's so frustrating. I just wanna leave you, leave you with this before we move into questions. At the end of any investigation report, what you really want to demonstrate more than anything, if you want to achieve change, if you want to achieve change, you have the risk owner has to has to take away if nothing else they take away from this, the level of risk they'll accept for the controls they decide to implement 
or not implement. So if they don't, if they put the controls in, this is the level of risk they'll have. And this is it. Like this is an accurate statement of the level of risk that you'll, you'll, you'll end up with if you implement these controls or this is the level of risk you will retain if you don't implement decent controls. So that's that's the key takeaway. Hopefully, hopefully you, you take away, and we've got to, We've got to give that information to them. That wraps it up for me. Um, look, we're online. Um, we've got a website, investigationsdifferently.com.au. There, my details. If you've got a second, I'll leave that up for a few seconds. Um, if anyone wants to snap that, um, that, that'll take you to our website. My phone number's there. Reach out. Um, this is the first time we presented this material. I know there was a lot in there and some of it we, we didn't cover into great depth, but that's because it would take a lot more to, to, to do. So Sarah, that, that, wraps, that wraps me up. Um, any questions, I guess? Yes, lots. Um, they're mostly, well, I'll, I'll just start with the first one. Um, I suppose it was from early on. Doesn't this fall onto management, especially if the investigator is the small SME and it's resented as a represented as a single simple traffic light report which identifies legal responsibilities. Um, they are so busy uh, managers. We, we, well, it's points. If you think you're getting what you need out of your investigation reports, then stay with what you're doing. Um, my 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 uh, experience is that our investigation reports aren't driving change. They aren't driving risk reduction. Um, and yes, management should should have a role in this, and they will. Um, but if we give them, uh, if we simplify complex problems, um, we find more often than not they don't. They take a simple thing like, oh, well, we'll just rewrite the procedure. So yeah, um, and and again, I can, I, I think we need to. Um, do that, uh, we need to provide better information so they can make better decisions. Okay, so isn't cost in the risk management code the last option to consider? Um, it's affordability is something, affordability to the business is something we, don't, we actually aren't allowed to consider, uh, but in, in considering grossly disproportionate, um, cost um, has to be a factor because there's, there's no other real way to work it out. Um, unless you work it out uh, monetarily because every every intervention, how do you work out if something's too expensive to do unless you monetize it? Okay, and um, shouldn't this be value of preventing a serious illness as a fatality is very rare and life is more than a value? Uh, look, it doesn't matter what it is, you can still use the same methodology. You don't, you, you, there will be um, values being attributed to, to serious illnesses. Um, so you can still use the same methodology. Um, and yeah, like, look, life is more of a value, but, but at the end of the day, um, calling, a, you know, calling a shovel a shovel, unless we put cost on it, because the controls are a cost, um, that it's a myth. It's, it's a myth that um, there's no price on safety. That's a load of rubbish. Uh, of course, there's a price on safety because um, everything has a cost and we've got to be able to We've got to be able to pay that cost or we don't take the risk. Um, Matthew asked, should we link critical controls with investigations? 100%. 100%. Your investigation report show, should show what contributed controls were either, either absent, failed or succeeded. Don't forget to put the succeeded ones in. But, yeah, I would link them in. Uh, and especially if it's a critical control failure, it means it wasn't effective. Um, and that is just another argument. Um, and clearly demonstrate why we should do that. Okay. Mark, let me know when you've, I know you've got to fly um, soon. I've got another, another few minutes, Sarah. Okay. All right. So um, how do you socialise the investigation when the party involved is only wanting the end result and then when they have it, they send it back for changes in turn prolonging the investigation? Um, oh, look, that, that that's fun, isn't it? Look, if you get some people that just aren't interested in talking to you, there's not much you can do. But what you need to do is start is is getting the practice of socializing them with things and it doesn't mean and, and try it informally people have lunch people go on breaks people go to the coffee um people you know people are in and out of meetings walk with them um have a quick chat it's just it, it might be 10 seconds it might be 30 seconds um 
But all we can do is try and do that. Um, the other thing is whoever owns your investigation system, uh, make it part of the process, systemize it if you need to. Um, okay, probably a bit similar. How do you progress with an investigation report that has been changed by the client and or the contractor, which is leading away from what factually happened, that is the wording, et cetera? Okay, so this is where as investigators, we need to start drawing lines in the sand as safety professionals. Um, we need to be supported by our, by our organisation system. The investigation report, once it's done, uh, look, you know, maybe this, you know, some softening of wording is okay, but the, the intent has to stay. And we need to start drawing lines in the sand. Look, the contractor thinks hard because, you know, they can be asses. I, I, I don't disagree. Um, when, 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 where clients can be hard to deal with and then that becomes a, client, a contractor management issue, uh, not investigation. Provided your internal report has the right things in it, then the contractor can have whatever they want. The client can have whatever they want, I should say. Okay, this last one, which I'm not sure I'm going to read correctly. How do you write the action when you cannot direct the finance or operations, when they do not respond well to directives? Hence the uh, term, terminology consider or suggest, etc. Uh, no, I don't like those two things. Basically, what you need to do is go to them beforehand. Um, you need to get them on board. You need to you need to win them over. You need to make them own it. So I don't ever, I, basically, if, if say maintenance own the issue, I go to maintenance and say, this is the issue, and they already know about it because I haven't surprised them. It's I socialise it during the investigation. How do you think we can fix it? What would you like to see done? They might go, well, if we could, we'd like to do all this. Okay, well, let's aim for that. If we can't do that, let's give a couple of options and we can go to the Bennett, we can go to the boss and say, bang, bang, bang. The trick with action holders is we don't surprise them, we don't force actions on them, let them develop it. Um, and then we'll, 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 we'll tend to get uh, better ones. Okay, um, and one last comment. Dennis is fantastic presentation and approach. He must fly. Um, Thank, thanks, Dennis. I appreciate it. That's very nice to hear. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, Mark. Um, yeah, well, we'll um, let you get on to your next meeting. And I've just put in the chat a link to our YouTube channel. Um, our IT person is away this week, but we will be uploading the uh, recording to YouTube and sending that link out later via email. Um, so that was great, Mark. Thank you very much. No worries. Thanks, everyone. And um, yeah, see you for the next one. Okay. Bye. Bye. You there, Sarah, are you staying on? Um, well, I can, but okay. Uh, yeah, I think I, yeah, I'll, I'll end it now. Thanks, Mark. Okay. No worries. Talk to you later. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. Bye.